Welcome to Everything Co-op, bringing you information on how cooperatives can help improve your quality of life. This show is being sponsored by the National Co-op Bank, NCB. The NCB is dedicated to strengthening communities nationwide for the delivery of banking and financial services for the nation's cooperatives, their members, and other socially responsible organizations. For more information on the power of community ownership, visit ncb.coop. That's ncb.coop. Now stay tuned for your host, Vernon Oaks. Good morning, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks on this beautiful, beautiful Thursday morning. Uh, welcome. We're glad that you're on. We have on the line with us Mr. Howard Broski. Mr. Broski, how are you doing this morning? Good, Vernon. How are you? I'm doing just great. I'm glad you Good. took time out of your busy schedule. I know it's busy with all that you do and all of the companies to start. Let's start off with the numbers. How many companies do you have or is in your co-op? We have uh, 14 different cooperatives in four countries that we operate in, and they do a little over $10 billion worth of volume and combined. $10 billion, that's a B, not the M. No. That's a billion, right. That's good news, right. $10 billion. <laughs> How many members in the co-op? Well, we have uh, in our basic uh, retail operation, thing, we have uh, almost about 3,600 different stores in that mixture. That's not including a child care group that has about 7,000 uh, child care centers that also belong. 7,000 child care centers. Right. And if that was 10 kids, that's 70,000 kids. And if it's 50 kids, right. it's a lot of kids, Eli. right? <laughs> we, we don't count the children, but there's a lot of kids. Okay. <laughs> okay. 7,000 child care centers. Right. And it, is that throughout the U.S. or throughout these four countries? No, throughout the, throughout the U.S., yes. Yeah. Yeah, our business is broken down basically in, in our retail divisions. We have a home sector. We, we have floor covering stores and lighting stores and a uh, general contractor network. And then we have a sports group of bike stores and ski stores, fitness stores. And then we have a group that does uh, the child care CCA for social good. And we have a group that does business services, Vision Night. Hmm. How, how do you keep on top of all of this? We I have very, one business. I have <laughs> We have very good people, very dedicated, committed people that believe in the cooperative concept and, and believe in helping uh, independent businesses succeed in a world where uh, scale is everything. And uh, I always say that you know, what we do is we level the playing field to give the independent entrepreneur the same buying power, the same marketing power, the same skill set that the large chains have. And I always think that when you can give an independent entrepreneur the same scale as bigger companies, they are actually more capable and they understand the community better and actually can do a much better job than, than anyone can. What well, Gina Schaefer from Ace Hardware told us about you, she was on the program last week. And yeah. that's exactly what she was talking about. So you are doing the similar kind of thing or same thing that they're doing? Yeah. Well, Ace Hardware does uh, for hardware stores what we do in many of our sectors. You know, so in in the floor covering, as I said, in the lighting world and in the biking world, we bring buying services and marketing services and training and real estate services and store design and social media and all the skill sets that you really take to be successful today in insurance buying and credit card processing. And bring it in a scale that an individual local person can take and use those scales in order to make them more profitable and also just make their life easier and more efficient. So if there's an entrepreneur out there listening today and they wanted to get a hold of you guys, that CCA Global, how do they get a hold to your company to try to see if they wanted to join in this cooperative or in one of these? Sure. I mean, they could just go, our website is ccaglobal.com and... They go on there and it lists all our different business units and contact information uh, with, within all the, the different units. CCAglobal.com. Yes. And right. how did you get the idea of starting this? What happened? Well, you know, the company's now 32 years old. I had a very, very close friend, Alan Greenberg, and we had both been president of the National Trade Association at the time, was the American Floor Covering Association, which which is now the World Floor Covering Association. And what we saw was that 
like many other industries and businesses, that the big chains were putting out a lot of local businesses out of business because yeah. they just couldn't compete. And it wasn't that they weren't smart enough. They weren't capable enough. They just didn't have the same scale and resources. And we had a lot of friends in the flooring business from being involved with the National Trade Association. And we said, boy, if, if we don't do something, our industry is going to have the same fate as every other industry. And we didn't even understand about a cooperative. We had a very close friend that introduced us to, at the time, uh, Larry Zephas, who was the CEO of Service Star Hardware in Butler, Pennsylvania, that they were based. And he was very kind to spend an entire day with us. And mm -hmm. we walked in. We didn't understand what a cooperative was. We walked out and said, we're going to start a cooperative. Well, um, can, I, can I stop you a minute? Because sure. this very kindness that you were talking about that he right. did, he gave you a whole day right. to tell you. That's what I find in the co-op world. People really share information, yeah. and they don't hold on to it. They, they're willing to share it, and that's the yeah. fifth principle of education, knowledge, and information. So they try to give it to people. It's unfortunate yeah. too many people are not out there trying to get it. I'm glad that you right. were looking for this information. Okay. Yeah. You can but but I, think, Vernon, I think you hit a good point. I think you know people in the cooperative world do it because they want to give back, because they want to make the world a better place, because they want to see – individual family businesses survive and they're more than willing to share their expertise and their time and uh, commitment to help others do the same thing. Well, it gets to the seventh principle and that's concern for community. Right. Uh, then when you're concerned for the community, you're concerned for the people in the community, the families in the community. And so you look yeah. for ways collectively of how you can help the community. And yeah, that's, and that's given knowledge. I think knowledge is right. more important than money I have found in my life. 69 years on this. No, oh, <laughs> it is. I mean, we, we were very happy. Dur during the recession, almost 25% of the industry went out of business in our main industries. In this is 08, and 08, lighting. the 08 yeah. recession? Yeah, and, and we only lost a little over 1% because, you know, we were just committed to help them through it. We lent money and expertise, and by being together, and, you know, it's the old thing with cooperatives. We say, you know, we're stronger together that we help people through that times. I learned about co-ops because I manage uh, housing co-ops. I started a property yeah. management company 22 years ago, and I learned about co-ops, and I really liked them. I find I love them for right. that reason. It's how do we help each other, particularly right. through the hard times. And the same thing with the housing market. And all of these foreclosures, you just didn't find it in the housing, in a co-op housing right. market because we didn't make a lot of those silly, bad investment decisions first. And then secondly, we helped each other. So, yeah. Yes, I, and I think with co-ops, you know, uh, people come first with cooperatives. Uh, you know, profit doesn't come first. People come first. Well, Pat Thornton, who is the producer of this program, gave me some information about you. I knew we were going to have a great conversation because right. what I learned about you is you love co-ops like I do. But yes, I, I, I cut you off with the story. You, you did the research. You went a day, and this gentleman just took the whole day to explain about co-ops, and you left there saying, we're going to start a co-op. What happened after that? Well, Al and I, uh, really, that's when we started planning. He had a, uh, businesses in St. Louis, and I did in New Hampshire, and we got together and brought some other friends in, and uh, we had a concept. With the first company was Carpet One, and what we were going to do, which was both the marketing and store design, it wasn't going to be just buying. You know, we always believe in the principle that just doing one of the one of the elements alone was not going to make somebody successful. So if it just bought cheaper, it wasn't good enough. You really need to you need to be a good marketer. You need to run your company well with good management tools and good merchandising. So we always believe that it had to be a holistic approach, and and that's how we built the company from day one, is a holistic approach to really making the retailer more successful. Okay, so. What I've talked about, for those of you that have not listened to this program before, a co-op is any business you can think of. And yeah. if it's owned and controlled by the employees, it's called a worker cooperative. If it's owned and controlled by the yeah. people that uses the product and services, it's called a consumer cooperative. And, for yeah. example, those are housing co-ops and credit unions. But if it's – you also have purchasing co-ops. that uh, They buy product. They normally get a better quality product. When people come together and buy the same thing, right. and they get it at a lower price – and then you have marketing co-ops and those that they come together and they sell the products and they have more markets they can sell to and they get people that with the expertise. So on both ends. And so it sounds like to me what you decided to do was have a purchasing co-op, a marketing co-op, 
and uh, to teach people how to run the business. So you look at the whole business aspect of it. And and what I found with the purchasing and marketing, you can normally find them in farmers, and they have a long history yeah. in co-ops. And right. the farmers run the business, and they let somebody else do the purchasing for them and let somebody else do the marketing for them because they can't do it all. Yeah, so, so, and I, I think yeah. that's so true is that, you know, you take this the, the very successful large companies, you know, the local manager doesn't buy the insurance. The local manager doesn't buy the site for the real estate. The local manager doesn't do the marketing. Uh, the local manager runs the store. And I think what we give is the tools, let the person do what, you know, let the individual entrepreneur do what they're good at. Let them take care of the customer. Let them understand the local community. Let them hire the people. And we give all the other tools so that they can concentrate on the things they're very good at. And we can provide the skills of the things that make it easy for them to run their business and run their lives. Howard, we got to take our first break. We'll, we'll okay. be right back. We're on with okay. Howard Broski, who's a co-founder of CCA Global Partners. Don't touch the dial. We'll be right back. Fourteen fifty WOL. It's power. That's why. National Cooperative Bank is sponsoring this program. NCB's mission is to help cooperatives grow by supporting and being an advocate for Americans' cooperatives and their members, placing special emphasis on serving the needs of communities that are economically challenged. And that gives NCB a really, really strong mission because most banks don't work in communities that are economically challenged. They normally look and work for people that have assets already, and that's not what you find in economically challenged communities. We have with us today Mr. Howard Broski, who's a co-founder of a $10 billion sales uh, business in four countries, uh, 14 different businesses. So when we left, you were telling us how you got started, how you learned about co-ops. Right. You didn't learn about it in school. <laughs> you, no. You went it's looking okay. for it. Right. So 32 years ago, you found about cooperatives. Right. I didn't. I've got a couple of master's degrees, and I heard nothing about co-ops right. in my former yes. education. Right. Right. So that's why we are trying to get this knowledge out to more people. Yeah, I think that's so important, Vernon, that the rest of the world understand all the benefits and all the great things that cooperative could do to, to reduce the inequality that we have in our world today. Reduce the inequality. Now, as a black American, I really want that, okay? <laughs> yes, I think yes. most Americans would want it, but with yes. the history of African Americans in this country, we definitely want equality same same right. sort of opportunities and that's what i find co-ops can do and i talk about with the third principle of co-ops of uh, you, you put some money in to join and then if there are dividends and profits you get some money back and that's a way of creating financial wealth i, I call it redistribution of wealth and so i've been challenged on that one so i want to change it it's redistributing new wealth okay right yeah not, not going back and say somebody else right. Give me 40 acres right. and a mew. I never believed right. that. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, yes. New well. How do you all uh, in your cooperative deal with uh, when you make money, how do you pass it back out to the cooperative membership? And who, well, are, the, and who are the out. members? Well, all the different members are based in the different cooperatives. So we have, you know, the 14 different cooperatives. So in some cases, they're the floor covering store. In some cases, they're the lighting store. In some cases, they're the the bike store, uh, so there are all the different members. Uh, but we've been fortunate. We we are now, we have distributed almost, uh, I think it was $1.3 billion back to the members. That's so, a B again. That's a B. Yeah, that's a billion, yeah. So beside making them, and I, we always say that that's the, uh, that's the dessert. You know, beside making them much more successful in their business and hopefully making them much more profitable in everyday business, the distribution of the profits back to the members, because as you know, in a cooperative, I don't, even though I was a co-founder, uh, I don't own a single share of the business. Uh, and none of our employees own a single share of the business. They are owned by the members, and we service the members. And as I said, we've given back over that period of time, which is a tremendous distribution of a quality of wealth uh, back. And, uh, you know, so it's been very good. And, you know, one of the things I'm, I'm most excited about now, Vernon, is is a new initiative, and I, which is Cooperatives for a Better World, to try to spread the word about cooperatives, 
not only across the United States, but around the world to really have it become the business model that people really look for to be a more a more a quality, more sustainable, and more people-focused in the world. Well, I looked at some of the numbers I think you presented. I can't remember where they were from, but it was that 78% of Americans don't know about what a cooperative is, yeah. and those that did right. know, only 11% of them could say, define what a cooperative is. Right. Yeah, I mean, that was interesting. We we did a, a very, very large survey uh, about a year and a half ago, and what we found is that, well, it, it was quite amazing. That, and I, I don't think it, it didn't really come to anybody's real surprise because when I talked to people and they said, what do you do after? It takes me an hour to explain. And, uh, <laughs> and I'm sure you have, you have the same thing. <laughs> you know? And even intelligent people. And we found that, you know, just a small percentage of the population, less than 10 percent, actually understood about cooperatives. But what was interesting is once we explained what cooperatives were. That's what I found interesting, and, too. Go ahead. And the principles <laughs> that 78 percent of the people said it would make a difference in their lives of where they would choose to do business, of what company they would choose to buy services from, that people loved cooperatives. So it wasn't, I mean, it, it fits with every principle today of what people are looking for, just that most people don't know what's there. And part of our mission with Cooperatives for a Better World is to bring that message out and to stop the inequality and to tell people around the world that all the good things the cooperative is doing from all the segments and to really start having a shift to have cooperatives be, to be the business model. You know, it's, it's really fundamental that, that the values of a cooperative, says in the tradition of their founders, cooperative members believe in the ethical values of honesty, openness, social responsibility, and caring for one another. Right. right. That seems to, yes. like, anybody in sort of any religious domain, any spiritual right. domain, that's what people want. Right. Say a business is built on those values is just phenomenal to me. Yes. Yeah, you know, as you know, it, yeah, it is. It it's built on caring for people, and and I think what people don't realize the scale that exists in cooperatives today, you know, is that you know in the United States there's over 100 million members, and worldwide there's a billion members of cooperatives. I mean, that's just enormous, and I think we've hit a a time where we can send this message, maybe more than any other time in the history of cooperatives, even though cooperatives have a long history, because I think. The inequality, say, Vernon, is so much in the forefront everywhere. You know, in, in our political campaign, we might not like how it's run, but they on both sides of the aisle right now, they all admit that the inequality is unacceptable. And, you know, when I always – the one figure I use is that, you know, the 62 people in the world have as much money as half the world's population. The, the, it's six, you can put them on a bus – have as much money as 3.5 billion people. And it's the inequality is just growing. And so I think between the inequality and the attention to the inequality, I mean, as I said, whether you're Republican or Democrat, everybody's saying that it is unacceptable to continue at this rate of the inequality. And, and it's not good. It's not good in our country. It's not good anywhere in the world. And the, the second part, which makes it, I think, cooperative such a time and a place in our history is that millennials now make up a third of the world's population and will make up 75% of the workforce in 10 years, love cooperatives. It, it fits every value and everything they believe in. And so they just have to understand about it. And the third part is, with social media today, you can get the message and you can get the word out in a way that you could never do 15, 20 years ago. 15, 20 years ago, if you wanted to change, and I have people understand concepts or believe in new movements, you know, you, you needed a, an awful lot of money. Mm -hmm. And today, that's not true. You, what you need is something to touch people's hearts. And now, when you say millenniums, can you define that so I make sure everybody knows out there what you mean? Yeah, you know, millennials is the, is the biggest population in the world uh, now. And I think they go from now from, I think it's 21 to 34, 35 years old. And, you know, they are the biggest population that there is. Uh, and I'm going to have more and more influence over everything we do in the world, the, and that their values are very different than previous values. You know, they, they are very socially conscious. 
and they want very, very much to do good in the world, and they they want to work for companies that do good in the world. So uh, I think that is a very, very, very important. I, I think it's actually between 18 and 34 is the actual set. And there's 75 million millennials just in the United States. Wow. Well, I know when I was that age, it was how to get a good car and a big house. That was it. Yeah. Right. And yeah. the other values you're talking about just, just was not there. Um, right. All right. So our yeah. job is to make sure we get this message out. And that's what you want to do. And building a better world was what the motto was for the 2012 United Nations. Right. Uh, said that 2012 was the year of the cooperative. Uh, were yeah. you were you at the U.N. Uh, in, I think it was November 2011? I unfortunately was not there. I heard it was, I heard it was great, and it was, look at the, it was a great start to ha- have worldwide re- recognition of the cooperative model. I was the president of the National Association of Housing Co-ops, and that gave me entry into that room, right. and it was just awesome. Uh, and yeah. In, in 2012, we had a White House briefing on co-ops. Had 150 cooperators there, and it was also equally uh, exciting uh, because. Yeah. Some of the staffers didn't know what a co-op was, and one staffer yeah. we we decided not to say who his name is. He he was asked if he knew about if he owned, belonged to a co-op, and he said no. And then somebody asked him, was he a member of a, of a um, credit union? He said, well, we we were members of two credit unions in our family. Right. So, right. Yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so people right. don't know, and it, highly intelligent people don't know about right. co-ops. So we have our work cut out for us. No, uh, I, I think you're right. I mean, the good news is that. The acceptance of what we're doing has, and the amount of people that have joined in this, and, and p- part of what we're doing is to give the tools to, for other co-ops to share with their employees and their members to tell them about all the co-op sectors by educating them and inspiring them. Because you know, as Vernon, you know, there, there are great stories of what people have done in co-ops, and so we're going to give people the tools to share those stories and to educate them so that. The employees themselves, we're going to start from the inside out. Uh, you know, given that there are over two and a half million employees in the United States and 200 million worldwide, and then a billion members, if we can just educate and inspire the our employees and members, my gosh, we, we can make an enormous change just by doing that. Well, let's talk about the change when we come back. We're taking okay. a second break. Uh, Howard Brosky, I'm having fun here. Thank you so much for everything you do, and we'll be right back. Fourteen fifty WOL. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. Uh, the program is Everything Cooperative. We have a web page. It's everything dot coop. You could go on it to look at, listen to other programs, previous programs, or you could sign up to get press releases on who is going to be on the program the following Thursday. Today, we are having the pleasure of talking with Mr. Howard Brosky, who has started a business 32 years ago, and it is highly successful uh, because he works with helping businesses to become successful. What else do you think caused you guys to be so successful? Well, I think we always said, I, I think one of the bases, Brian, when we started was that uh, you know our success is only is, is determined totally by our members' success, and I think we've been has stuck to that. Our success is based on making other people more successful, and we do that by by having a more holistic approach on everything we do for them. So I think it's being committed and and also being very entrepreneurial. I think it's very critical that uh, as, at CCA and all our divisions that we we have the the top talent. We have people that have just they're not only dedicated, but they're very smart and they're very good at what they do. And so we bring, I think, a level of expertise down to the local level uh, that could not be done. Uh, so, you know, they have the best in digital marketing and they have the best in store design and they have we, we have the sharpest minds. And as I said, I think there's a spirit of entrepreneurialism that runs through our company of making sure that, you know, uh, Wayne Gretzky, the great hockey place to say, I want to know, I want to be where the puck is going, not where it's been. And I think. We tried as a company to be where uh, trends are going and where business is going, not where things have been. And I, I think that's important that we stay ahead of the track for our members to think about those things. And 
I, I saw a little bit of a video where you're talking about the unexpected. Is that what you're talking about? Is that you provide the unexpected services by getting in front of what the customer needs? Or yeah, you know, you always have to anticipate. Uh, you know, customer change, but the the economy changes. You know, with you know, with the shopping patterns and changes and economic changes and millennials, it's very important to understand all the, the changes that are happening and have the tools that provide our members to, to satisfy those needs. And I think for, really, uh, for us to do the unexpected for our members, but also for the members to do the unexpected for their, for their customer base. What kind of training did you have, uh, Edgic Formal or as a kid, um, to give you this sort of insight? Well, uh, I went to uh, Wesleyan University and uh, actually majored in economics when I was uh, going to go to college. My sister, who who was very wise and said to me, that you shouldn't go to business college, you'll have it the rest of your life. So she said, go to a liberal arts college, which I did. And so actually I majored in economics and minded in art. But I think Wesleyan taught people how to think and how to think outside the box. And I think that was a, a great benefit of my education. And, and I... I think uh, a lot of people who graduate there tend to be uh, creative and innovative uh, more than in a, in a set pattern of a certain thing they do. Wow. Uh, Knowledge. Okay. Creativity. Yeah. Thinking outside of the box. Yeah. Okay. Critical yeah. thinking. Yeah. Did they teach you how to speak also? Public speaking? No. No. No, they did not. <laughs> Probably it would have been good, but they they, they did not. Uh, you know, it was a, a, a true liberal arts education. All right, so you got educated there. Did you get any master's degrees or? No, I was anxious. Of, you know, we had a little family business in Manchester, New Hampshire, uh, that was a floor covering business, and my father had passed away. I was very young, and I was fortunate. My mother had stepped in to run it because I told her that's what I wanted to do when I got out of college. And she was, my mother was actually a pharmacist, and she stepped back in to run the business till I got out of college. And when I got to college, I was I was very focused. Uh, I think I would have loved to go on to graduate school, but there was some financial and time pressures to come back and be in the business, and I did. And you know, I think that's where one of my loves I saw from my father, and uh, you know, he was a, my father was a Russian immigrant. The love that he had for starting a small business was incredible, and you know, it was just pride and joy, and that's that's where I wanted to be and come back to. So I taught business at the in Howard at Howard University. I taught marketing and I, I told my students that, you know, I can teach you the marketing and the concepts and even the math behind it. But I can't teach you what I think you learned with your father. And that is when you cross the table from somebody and they say they can do something or they will do something is to know whether or not they're, they really can do it and what makes a good deal or not a good deal for you. So you got that at your father's lap or at the table or at, on the floor of business, <laughs> that those, those sort of intuitions that you get at the gut. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, no, I think a lot of it is, uh, is, is intuition and having faith in what you believe in. And, you know, so I, I, I think I did pick up a lot. Of, you know, you pick up a lot at a young age, and I, I think it's one of the reasons I think both Al and I, when we started, could empathize very well with local Small, how, you know, businesses. You, small businesses. I mean, we, that's where we were. And so I, I think to understand what they go through and their care for the community, their care for the business, but also the struggles they go through to try to run a independent business, it's not easy today. And that's why you see the failure rate is so high. And I think one of the things is without a cooperative, it's one of the reasons you see this inequality happen because what happens is, you know, you lose your business, and then you go work for a job that you don't want, at a lower income and a lower pay that you have for the you know the rest of your life. And by have, being part of a cooperative, you can maintain your standard of living and hopefully get better and also be part of the community and give back to the community. So the cooperatives do so much, so many good things in so many levels, Brian. Well, what you just described, and I got a real good picture of, is that that small business owner lost his business, and he went to get a job. At something that he did not necessarily want to do, didn't feel like it. So he wakes up right. in the morning, looks in the mirror, and says, I don't really want to do this. Right. Or he has to fight to get up to go. As opposed to having a business that's in a cooperative and people working together, helping together. And when he gets up in the morning, he jumps out of the bed. Yeah. His self-confidence is so great. 
Yeah. It's that not only is what he's doing for the community is what he's done for himself and therefore his family, and it just goes out into the community like that little pebble in the water just goes. It just yeah. keeps going out, keeps going out, keeps going out. Yeah, no, we you know so many of our members give back so much into the community, and I think one thing about just the cooperative model, it's much more sustainable. And you know, people don't have the security they have, and when you have when you're part of a cooperative, you have much more security. And I think uh, much more faith, and, and they are stronger together. You talked about the high failure rate of and you, normally a guy goes out, guy, woman, they go out, they start a business, have a great idea, and within five years, how many of those would likely fail? I think the, uh, and it, it varies by business, but I think within the first five years, the failure rate is up around 40%, 50%. It's a very high failure rate. And then even father, I mean, there's very few. We we have some of our members that have celebrated 100 years in business, which is unheard of. But the failure rate, I think there's two things we're learning. Being alone, number one, isn't good for business. It's also lonely uh, that you don't have anybody to bounce ideas off, that you don't have anybody that would advise you. And so number one is if people don't do as well economically. I think they don't do as well spiritually and, you know, emotionally. You know, we find that there's, a, there's a great bond with our members and a great friendship that develops within them. And so not only do they have a security by having a larger organization, providing them with all the tools they need to help. Yeah. I think they also have emotional security with people helping them to really care about them, that they can share ideas with and share business with. Phenomenal. I can testify because I'm a small business owner that I started 23 years ago by yeah. myself and I was the president, vice president, secretary, treasurer, mm-hmm. clean the desk off, take out the trash, whatever it took. Mm-hmm. And we're still in business, but it's been very difficult at times. But I got an MBA from Stanford University, and a group started, uh, we just started a group. There's about eight to 12 of us that meet once a month. We all have different businesses, but we all have the same problems. And that has been so right. helpful. In the last year and a half, year, four months, the, I've been working with the employees to buy it as a worker cooperative, and that's been uh-huh. fun, the learning that has happened, but me and sure. the, So I would have put that failure rate higher. Uh, I don't know, maybe within 10 years it was 78%, 75%. It was some yeah. really high number. Oh, so, I think it is. So, yes, I, I, I think, Brian, I think you're exactly right. I think it's a, it's a, it's a very high failure rate. And by different industries, it's higher. Like if we're in the restaurant business, like oh, yeah. the failure rate, I can, even with the first two years, is enormous. So, yeah, yes. that if if you get in the restaurant business and you're highly successful, you can make a lot of money. But most don't. Right. <laughs> most don't. Yes. don't make. Right. But in a co-op, I haven't seen a study on it. But it's like what what's happening in in my business is to learn. We this whole year, fourteen year, four months, so sixteen months or so, it's been nothing but training. So they're learning the, how to read a uh, income statement and customer service and how to make decisions because they just used to look to me and I used to make the decision. So I had to learn how not to make the decision. So you all make the decision, and right. watching that happen has been phenomenal. So with them, because this training happens with a group of people to come together, it's like in the first ten years there was like five or ten percent failure rate. It's something so much so right. smaller, just like what happened in a downturn in housing markets and with your floor covering companies, you're looking right. at, you said something, 25% failure rate out there in the whole world, but your people was 1% failure rate. And yeah, no, it, it, your co-ops just bring so much uh, to the table to give them the tools and the backing and the support during good times, they make more money and during bad times, they can work their way through it. And without that support and without the uh, without the scale and without the economics of the scale and without the different services, it's it's extremely tough. I, I was just looking. I think I think the failure rate actually in ten years, according to Inc. Magazine for small business, is ninety six percent. Oh my god! Oh my god! So okay. we're both wrong. wrong. That's, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't want to take that to Vegas. No, that's not, that's not, that's not good odds. Well, I would uh, bet on a failure. That's what I yeah. Would bet. Okay. Right. So, so it's it's really not, and as I said, it varies by industry, obviously. But uh, cops do provide just such a cushion, and you know, 
it, it really has made people, you know, we have members that have gone from uh, doing $2 million to doing $50 million. I mean, it, we have had people that have just been enormously successful across all parts of the country and uh, um, across so many sectors of our indus of industries. Well, I normally ask this question later, and I, I don't really want you to answer it now because we have to take our next break, but sure. uh, what I wanted to ask you, and maybe after the break you can come back and answer, is do you like what you do? And then oh, why? Okay. And right. okay. it would be the same question for your 14 different companies and right. all of the members right. in it. And I, I got to answer. And the second question is, why do you think that people don't know about co-ops? What it's right. been highly successful. NCBA has been now in 100 years. They're celebrating 100 years of being around NCBA, CLUSA. And it's like they've been around so long. Why is it that people don't know about it? It's been a huge burning question of mine. And I've come up with right. some hypotheses. Yeah. Uh, sometimes one person told me I was cynical. Uh, right. with my <laughs> but do you like what you're doing? And why is it that? people don't know about co-ops and sure. we are going to take our final break the hour goes by real quick when you're having fun and learning but we'll be right back with our last segment fourteen fifty W O F. Information is power. That's the reason that WOL is a great, great, great partner with everything.coop because what we're doing here is providing information about cooperatives, the benefits of the cooperative, so that you may take this information, either start a cooperative, do the homework, do the research, do the, get the knowledge that you need, or you could go look for one like CCA Global and the different companies that are cooperatives so you can get good services, uh, get a good product for a competitive price, if not a lower price. What's the answer to the two questions? Do you like what you're doing, Mr. Howard Brosky, and why do you think it, that people don't know about co-ops? Well, Vernon, I don't like what I'm doing. I love what I do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I would tell you that. Um, <laughs> you know, I think my passion for cooperatives is, runs deep and it's part of who I am. I do love what I'm doing. I wake up every day. Sometimes my wife says, my gosh, you pop out of bed. Aren't you tired? <laughs> and, uh, you know, I get, no, up no. Early, early. I, I get up at 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the morning, and I love what I do every single day. And, and part, so what happens? Why? I love what I do because I see the effect it has on people, on families, on communities. It's not numbers. You know, we, I, you could say our numbers are big. It has nothing to do with numbers. It all has to do with how we affect people's lives and that we have uplifted families and their lives and their effect on communities uh, and, you know, stopping this inequality that happens and give people sustainable businesses and, and lives and, and the difference it can make. And these people go back and do such social responsible. And I also love it because I, I'm very fortunate that we work with such a group of talented people that they love what they do. And that they love to help change people's lives. And it's it's really our organization is mission based. It's not, you know, we don't look at the end of the day and say, oh, my gosh, you know, we're, our quarterly profits are this. And, you know, we look in the stock exchange and say, oh, my gosh, look, look what we made today. You know, we look at the, how many lives did we change today and how do we make the communities better by what we do? You know, what you're talking about is something I've learned. It's, it's simple, but you say mission-based, not profit-based. I went and got, got my MBA so that I could make money. Growing up in Bluefield, West Virginia, relatively poor, wanted money. I found out the more I grabbed for money, it seemed like the further away it went. Yeah. And um, then I just started doing what I would call just do what's the right thing to do regardless of whether you make money or not or right. whether you may perhaps even lose money. But then I found money would come. It would come yeah. from all kinds of different ways, and you wouldn't even right. expect it. And so just do the right thing, mission-based, <laughs> okay? Right. All right, yes. just do the right thing, then it all work out. It, it works. Yeah. 
particularly if you have talented right. people doing it. So, yeah, I right. totally agree with my life experience. But then why is it that people don't know about co-ops? Well, that is the, the, the not the million dollar, the, the zillion dollar question. <laughs> so I think there's several things, Vernon, and I think it's the heart of what we're doing with Cooperatives for a Better World. And by the way, people should go on our website. We have one now, but the actual finished website is coming live at the end of this month. So it's cooperativesforabetterworld.coop or .com, but it's .coop. And, you know, our mission with that is so much to try to educate and inspire. I think what's happened, if I would say why, co-ops are, it's number one, it's a little confusing because a co-op in housing is different than a co-op in it's a credit union that's different than a food co-op. I think people, the one thing they understand about it is a food co-op. So, you know, Carpet One, if they go in the store, people didn't understand it was the cooperative. And, you know, the farmers, they, you know, they understand maybe Ocean Spray and they understand Lando Lakes, but they don't understand all the farmers behind it. And, you know, it's so many different pieces to so many different people. The commonality is that co-ops care about people. People come first. You know, that that the social mission comes before profits. So it doesn't matter what sector you're in, but there are so many different sectors that's complex for people to understand. It's not like a single business under a single name and saying, we're going to do this. Uh, but what we do is so meaningful and so important. And I think because social media had not for many years, again, it's fairly new, I say new, mm -hmm. You couldn't get the story out. But if we share the right stories in social media and we can inspire people and educate the employees and the members, there was never an initiative to do it across all segments. And what we have found is we're also going to build a co-op exchange, which is like an Amazon marketplace just for cooperatives to do business because if people want to be socially conscious – the question is, where do they go? Where do they find the business that's socially conscious? How do they find REI or Lando Lakes or the farmers or the food, the right? And we're going to build a co-op exchange It's going to be that you can locate any cooperative in any community, anywhere in any country, anywhere in the world, and buy those services or locate those services because millennials and a lot of other people are really concerned about socially responsible companies. And... We're going to make it easy for them to find socially responsible companies. Well, I must be a millennium because I, I'm very concerned about socially responsible companies. <laughs> okay. and, and I think part of – so in, in a very short period of time, we already have 13 countries participating in this, including not only the United States and Canada and England, but including China, you know, and including India, including Argentina and Greece – and Japan, um, and Bulgaria, and Brazil. So the, this movement is is taking a hold at a very fast pace, and it is really going to change the entire co-op landscape. Well, anything I can do to help, it sounds fantastic. NCBA had tried this cooperative exchange, and I don't know what happened that it fell within the U.S., but they never ever get booted it out. So... I really like the idea of what you're doing. I'm sitting here excited, dancing in my chair. Cooperatives for a Better World dot co op, uh, cooperative exchange. Those two things sound extremely exciting. And I tell you why, for there's a book called Community um, Cities Building Community Wealth and uh, Democracy Collaborative. They wrote the book. And one, in the first page or two, there's about a story about a lady by the name of Maria who lived in New York City who cleaned houses. And she was making $7 an hour before they started their co-op. And in the co-op where they owned the business and they shared the profit, she was up to 20 bucks an hour. Yeah. From $7 an hour to 20 bucks an hour because she's sharing profit as opposed to the one of the problems I had with going right. to $15 an hour base, whatever they call minimum wage is that's going to cause all of the potentially cause all of the products to go up and we get inflation. Right. So I like the idea of worker cooperatives because now they get the profit. And I believe that the reason we don't know about co-ops is those 62 people that around the world that get all of that money or you right. got the 1% is here to get like 50, 60, 70% of all new wealth. Right. They don't want people to know about it because then they will, we will share the profit. 
And it, right. that means it takes it away from them. So I think, and that's when I was called cynical, I think the the people that have wealth and that they they then they put money in and they hire a politician and the politicians make policies where they make more wealth, that whole system, if we know about co-ops, it means that we get in, we get involved, everybody, and everybody can share in this profit and we don't have inflation. Well, that makes sense. And I think that the time is now to have it happen. As I said, the inequality has gotten worse and the attention to the inequality has been highlighted. And so I think co-ops are at a time in life in our history where I think co-ops can make a huge difference and where people want it. And once they get exposed to it, they're going to get behind it. Yes. So we'll do yeah. all we can do. And then on the Democracy Collaborative Well page where it has, talks about this book, it says, Fighting Inequality with Comprehensive and Transformative Solutions for Community Economic Development. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. No, I think, you know, cops just by the nature do so much good and can solve so much of the social and economic inequality and just have a much more sustainable, uh, satisfied life for people around the whole world. A lady from the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives, uh, maybe it's Federation of Worker Cooperatives, um, at NCB's annual meeting last year said that of the new, the first of the growth in worker cooperatives, and it was either 40 or 60 percent, I don't remember the number she said, are people of color. So yeah. I found that exciting that folks right. of color are getting in and creating worker cooperatives. And we don't have that many, so we need more. Yeah. What else What else could you tell us in our last minute here? Uh what, what parting words would you like to say to people that are listening? Well, you know, I think one one phrase that has stuck with me for a long time is Pauline Green, who was president of the International Co-op Alliance. Dame Pauline Green. Yes, yes. Dame Pauline, who's an ma- amazing woman, Yes, says, said that cooperatives are the only structure in the world where you can bring people out of poverty with dignity. Yes. And I, I think that's true. You know, with cooperatives, people have dignity. And they own a share, and they, it becomes sustainable. So I think, you know, cooperatives, you know, it's why we say it's cooperative for a better world. It is for a better world, Vernon. Well, I was hoping we could talk about politics uh, and how we could get more cooperatives involved in this political time, presidential election. There is something called vote.coop, that's the National Rural Electric Cooperatives. If you go on there, you can find out if you're registered or not. So I'd like to get more people to do that. Right. And maybe you can get your folks that pass it through, that get their customers to vote. Make sure we get out and vote this time. we got to yeah, go vote. I, very critical. I agree. And yes. I'm wanting the politicians to know how big a hand that cooperatives have, how much power that we have in the communities so we can have more say and get monies to create more worker co-ops and more cooperatives. That would be great. Thank you, sir. I've really appreciated this conversation. I'd like to do some more and get information on your two new web pages so I can do what I can to help you guys, too. Thank you. Thank you, Bernie. Thank you so much, Bernie. Have a great week, everybody, and have a week full of cooperation. 1450 WOL.